Do you have a covenant modification on Emerson? Um, we get in here on that? Um, I just had a hard copy. So this is um this is periodic this is a performance guarantee request. So as part of subdivision approval, before an applicant starts building, um, they're required to post a performance guarantee so that um, everyone can be assured that the infrastructure will be installed in accordance with the plans and um, you know, at the beginning of a project, there's a lot of money that's required because they're just starting and there's a whole lot of work to be done, but periodically through the project, applicants typically come back and ask for either swapping out covenants so as they build, they can sell a house and put the covenant on a different house loft, I should say. Um, so that's what this um, um, request is, to swap out um, the covenant. Um, Covenant, so I have a, one ready for, and they're they're still they're proceeding on construction. It's really um, pretty standard to we, we require two lots to be under covenant plus a financial guarantee. So this is really just swapping um, some of the lots as they as they move forward. Um, and there's still a whole other phase. Um, the property owners here, if you want to um, say anything else, um, Rich. That's um, <laughs> um, so I've looked over this and it's um, the language is um, you know replacing the covenant shall replace or release the covenant on lots um, one four and five which is the duplex lot at um, the Oaks um, and in this case there were a lot there, there were a, um, a bulk of lots that are in an area where they haven't done the road construction yet those would um, those would be Main the same but be tweaked a little bit and then just run with the land on lots 20 through 48 so there's still two lots that are buildable that have financial um, you know value uh, plus the remaining lots that aren't on any um, road yet um, so my recommendation would be to approve that swap so they can continue to move forward so I just need a motion why does something like this end up in front of us versus something at the staff level it's um, always required that the board has to approve any financial um, obligations for construction that you all approve. It's just a statutory requirement. Okay. So it's just a rotation of the laws? Yes. But it affects, nothing's changed. Right. So we don't have any issue with it. Do you need a formal motion? Uh, yes. Yes. Make that formal motion. Second, that's all in favor. All right, one down. This next one I'm sure will be just as quick. Um, <laughs> scheduled for 7.30. Uh, the settlement agreement for appeal in the Kansas Soccer Club Special Permit uh, 0 ID 45 um, do you want to walk us through that one, Carolyn, or do we... Yeah. So, um, I think we got the... I did send this request to you. So, um, as you know, you had a hearing on the um, request for um, a new permit for the um, Northampton Soccer Club. And the permit was appealed because they were... Um, there were a couple of permit conditions that were too, they felt were too onerous. Um, and I don't know if the representative. Oh, hi. hi. <laughs> I see you come in. Um, so the, I, the issue is so we're in this period where city, we have to determine, you know, how we're going to proceed in terms of going through the court process, or um, there was a proposed settlement that, you know, if the board agreed to this, then they could withdraw the appeal and we can move forward. Mm -hmm. um, the alternative would have been to file an amendment, which would give it the same thing. So we're, we're sort of, they could either file an amendment, but they also wanted to protect their ability to, you know, take it to the next step if they needed to. Um, I think the, one of the issues was after the hearing was closed, the applicant couldn't describe why these um, possible conditions would be onerous because the public hearing was closed. So I don't think you um, were able to hear what the justification would be for why that wouldn't work or why it might make sense. Um, the one in particular was um, not allowing games during the week. Right. 
Um, so, um, and practices only, and I think the rationale, which I can let the um, appellant speak to that, was, um, you know, with practices, you might have actually more traffic or just as much traffic as games because you have drop off and then come pick up. So you might have two trips per activity as opposed to a game where parents and people might settle in and just stay. Um, so, and then the other piece of it was the, um, sorry, was the length of the permit. Or, sorry, give me a second here. Um, but Carolyn, I have a question. Yeah. Because the permit reads the opposite. Only games are allowed during the week. Yeah, Practices and games may be held on weekends. Um, sorry. Right, back um, let me just see what the yeah. Seems backwards. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. Yeah, the, the notes I had was for two years, no practices during the week, which is only games. Game and practice schedules had to be sent out, and we, we reduced it to two fields. How is this logistically being handled down there? This isn't a formal hearing. It's not a formal hearing, but we are. Uh, so the city solicitor asked that we, you know, notice the abutters. So all notice was sent to the abutters, and we posted it in the Gazette. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not posted as it's. It's really a conversation about this, the settlement option. Um, so you can take public comment okay. um, if you, if, you know, to help you. Come to that decision. Okay. And, and the settlement option is that there would be practices. I'm just trying to understand what the the option is, other than what the permit says. <clears throat> um. Yeah. I'm sorry. And games and practices should be allowed on the two fields at any time. Right. Okay. Right, so the striking of, sorry, the, the modification of the conditions would be to strike the, um, you see the three, the second two conditions, and then, um, and then the language in item one, which is what I was um, trying to go over. Um, so then the conditions that would stand, that are proposed on the table would be the permit range for two years, um, and two fields only may be used at any one time. And then um, the criteria, the findings, would um, strike that last tenant for only games and no practice to strike. Um, so that's what's on the And so it's really open for you all to discuss here what, um, you know, sort of both sides again and make that determination if you don't want to enter the, you know, there's, there's no pressure, there's two, you know, if you don't feel it's appropriate, then, you know, we would go forward however the city needs to represent. Mm -hmm. So basically they want games and practices during the week mm -hmm. and they don't want to be, uh, have the onus of notifying when the, when the games are? Well, notifying the city, but not individual, not the neighborhood, per right. se. Right, right. Okay. Games and practices is what they've been using, what they've been doing, historically. Uh, right. right, and then there was this whole issue at the last hearing that right. that wasn't, right. right. 
Carolyn, does this appeal process, does it open up the ability for the board to, to make further changes or we're limited to the request and the appeal? <clears throat> well, um, because it's a settlement, you, theoretically you could decide, you could mutually decide on um, agreeable terms mm -hmm. and then both parties would agree to, you know, would file their appropriate court, their papers in court to close out the, the appeal. Well, I'm unclear. Who, who decide? I mean, is this the board or the city solicitor or the planning department? Who, who agrees to a settlement? Well, what some, um, it could be, it could be either any one of those bodies, but typically, I mean, you know, what might happen is we go to court, you know, takes months and months, and then the judge turns around and says, remands it back to the board. So then the board has to make the decision. Well, or during that process, there might be a request for settlement. And, you, you know, the city always wants the board to sign off on that because you all made the decision in the first place. So it would be appropriate that the board do that and not staff the city solicitor. And the city, you know, represents the board in that capacity. So also, I guess what could happen is we could agree to this and then a disgruntled neighbor could decide to take it to court and continue it in the other direction. Well, right. Um, the I suppose they could, and I don't know. I don't know how the, the process would work from that standpoint because it's not an amendment, and I would have to defer to. <clears throat> the attorneys in the room to tell me <laughs> what exactly the procedure would be on that. And that during that would make sense though. During this appeal, um, what's in place? The decision right. as it right. was issued. Right. 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 So is this like a petition uh, a request for a rehearing by the board? Is that what it amounts to? I mean, is this whole thing open? Are we going to redo listen to all the neighbors and the applicant and start all over? What What are we doing? Um, I think you would hear what the justification would be for the request um, and make a decision whether it makes sense to. You don't know. You don't have to open the whole thing up, but if you feel like there's a rationale they want to present as to why this makes sense um, that that you didn't hear before, then you can do that. Okay, so it might make sense to limit comments just to what we didn't already hear. If that's feasible. Yeah, let's 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 jump in then and Mark maybe you can start us off and say why why we're here tonight in the first place. Sure. And I apologize for the way I'm dressed. I actually just came from practice. But uh, my name's Mark Tanner. I'm uh, the president of the Northampton Soccer Club. Do you guys mind if I sit down? I'm also an attorney at a law firm called Bacon Wilson, and I'm the guy who filed the uh, the appeal of this. So the, the, the issue was is that during, and, and I understand you spent a lot of time considering the merits of what's going on at the Oxbow and talking about it and listening to the neighbors the last time we were here, but there was a, a pretty critical piece of misinformation that I think led you to take away uh, the practice component of the field. What happened was there was a permit which was issued uh, several years ago which essentially said that we could play games there but that we couldn't practice there. <coughs> At about the same time, maybe a year after that permit was issued, uh, the legislature passed something called the Permit Extension Act which basically retroactively renewed all the permits that had expired during a certain period of time. One of the permits that expired during that period of time was the permit that allowed us to use the Oxbow for any purpose. And that's the basis upon which we were continuing to have practices uh, at the Oxbow in addition to games, even though there was a conflicting permit which said no practices. As a, as a practical matter and a financial matter uh, for the club, uh, it's, it's impossible for us to keep that facility if we can't use it for practices. Uh, all that it does is it limits us to basically in the fall, one game on a weeknight and then at most probably three games on a Saturday. I can tell you that we, there's no team that practices there on Saturday or Sunday. Practices would be Monday through Friday, 
uh, during the spring, I'm sorry, during the fall, it's a pretty discreet period of time. It's from about 5 o'clock until about 7 o'clock because it gets dark out and you can't practice. In the spring, it's from about 5.30 or 6 when people get out of work until dark. So you're really talking about a relatively discreet period of time that we're using those fields um, for practices. With two fields there, the reality is the most you could have there is probably four teams if they split those two fields. Uh, from the city's perspective, uh, once you enacted this permit that we've taken the appeal of, uh, it really wreaked havoc on the Parks and Recs Department. There simply isn't enough field space in Northampton to allow for teams to practice. And so what's happened is they've had to develop a new policy whereby they're taking areas that are basically patches of grass and they're designating those as practice areas now. So for example, at Jackson Street School, there's a soccer field there, uh, which is actually Northampton Soccer Club's goals. We take, actually, take care of lining the field. We more or less maintain the field for the city. Uh, but there's also an area of grass back behind a softball or a baseball field that's there. Uh, and so they've now designated that as a practice area. <coughs> and so what's happened as a practical matter is you've taken uh, the traffic that was going to the Oxbow and you've just moved it into different neighborhoods. And so that same amount of traffic is just affecting a different group of uh, citizens of Northampton. And the teams are practicing in areas which really aren't meant for practice. They're meant to be open patches of grass or they're meant to be part of a, a baseball field. Uh, I can tell you that the, the way that youth sports have proceeded, there's now fall football, there's now a fall baseball league, so areas where they might have previously had soccer fields are now being used for baseball fields. And from what I understand from speaking to the city, once they bring those Florence fields online, what that really results in is a net to the, to the city when they take into account all the other uses they have to make of those fields. Is a, is a one soccer field. That's the net, my understanding, as to what they're going to have when you figure out where the Northampton JV team and the freshman team and all those people are going to go at the end of the day. It's a, it's a net of one soccer field. And so in the near future, there's really no practical remedy to, to using the Oxbow. And, it, and what it's done is really wreak havoc on teams that are trying to find practice areas uh, by not being able to practice there. Uh, and I thought it was important that you guys have that piece of information before you uh, because I think it was relatively important in the considerations that you were making. Question, one of the things that wasn't crossed off was the, the two field issue. We, went, we requested to go from four to two, correct? Correct. If we went from four to three and everything else stayed the way it was, would that, what impact would that have? So the, the most games they're ever going to, so the way that the league we work in, we play in works, is you have to have one field for every six or seven teams that you feel, just because of the limited number of referees and things like that that they have. And so as a practical matter, the most fields we would ever need, given historically the number of teams that we fielded, is two or three fields. We have the use of the small field that leads through the city. Uh, we share that with another soccer club in town called the Western Mass Football Club, uh, which is another local group of teams that plays in the same league that we play in. Uh, and then we've historically had the fields at the Oxbow. And so as long as we can have two fields for games at the Oxbow, mm -hmm. that's, that's more than enough fields because you then take into account the, the Leeds field. I, I understand the, the, there was a conflict, there was a redundancy at one point with two permits in effect, one that got carried through but the second one, although it didn't count, basically, but the second one was in response to the concerns of the neighborhood and so forth. And one of the conditions was no practice during the week. And that was, at that time, a, a condition that was born out of you know, all the traffic and the complaints and so forth. So even though it was in effect when we came forward to this period to the board, that was a condition that wasn't being met. Um, and we thought this is, you know, two strikes, this is your third opportunity, we're going to try it again and try to put into effect what we understood had already been into effect but hadn't been met. Um, and so that was the rationale behind it. No, I, and, and I appreciate that. I, I guess switching to the lawyer mode of me, uh, the, the appeal claims that your decision was arbitrary and capricious in violation of law. 
And I'd suggest to you there's actually no empirical data from any source to show that there's a traffic issue on Island Road. If you look at the data that the city has, compare it to other similar streets, if you look at the records from the police department, there's no history of accidents there. And I understand that you were listening to the neighbors and imposing that condition, and there was this historical commission, condition out there, uh, which although not operative during that period of time, was based upon some decision making on the board. I, mm -hmm. I have to fully uh, agree that those are true. Good. So with the, getting to the practice number um, fields, if practices were allowed with just one field as opposed to two fields, um, would that, um, you know, if two fields are allowed with, with games, then you've got, you know, two fields of games going, but I don't know how that works with you all. Well, I mean, so if you had two fields and there was a game going on on one field, I mean, the way they would normally try and do it, as long as it's light out, is to schedule two games in a row. So they'd have a game at 5.15 and then a game at 6.30. And once it gets later into the fall, then they just have one game. But if there are games on one field, then that field's not even, we can't use that field for practice at all. And so I don't think that, if, if you were considering, okay, there could be a game on each field every night of the week, there's really no net increase in traffic by allowing practice because you still only have the two fields and you can still only use the two fields, you know, in the same manner that you'd use them for games. Well, I was suggesting more if there was if practice during the week would be allowed, but only on one field. So you couldn't have two fields oh. being used for practice. That's a lot different impact than having a game, you know, if, or if a game and a practice. Right. Um, so, because you, right now it says two fields, but it doesn't specify. Uh, I mean, potentially you could be using both fields for games on the same night at the same time. <coughs> right. So does that make a difference if you can't use two fields for practice at the same time? Um, play out what if we just, you know, we just took a vote three months ago. What if we say, as far as we're concerned, we took a vote, we're done with it. What happens? Well, then we would just carry, I mean, the city would have to would issue a response to the appeal. So it would be, be between the solicitor and the, the uh, Right. The well, city. So the city, the city, city, city would go forward and the, the city would have to fight over and, and be a thing, yeah. whatever. Right. So in an effort not to go through all that and figure out something. Right. Okay, so if you had one, to follow up on Carolyn's idea, if you had one field that was available for practice per night. It, it, that would certainly be better than no fields. Um, once again, you're still taking kids and just shifting them to different places in the city and shifting that traffic to different places in the city, but yes. Right, but you could argue we're shifting them to other areas of the city that have, and have a right to have, soccer fields and playing athletic fields. But the issue here was, does the actual have the right to even have those? Well, in areas that can accommodate the traffic, I mean, right. traffic on Jackson Road is very different than traffic on Island Road. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'd like to go back, I, I was not here for that one, but I, I'm, I'm, uh, I feel a little bit misled about, well, that we had this permit that somebody else made a ruling on, and even though ours preceded that, yeah, you that, can say that, that... No, that's not correct. You had issued a permit, you then issued a second permit. And this legislature said, you know what, we're going to revive all the expired permits, and therefore the first permit that this board issued was still legally and operative. And it was not superseded by the one we issued later. That, that's correct. That doesn't feel right. <laughs> just, just for the record, that doesn't feel right. <coughs> And what is actually happening right now? You had, you had practice tonight or a game? I had practice in Granby tonight. And I can tell you that there are teams practicing all over the place. This is a different club than the oh, Northampton yeah. Soccer Club, but we've, we, we, we've practiced all over the Pioneer Valley in order to find field space. And I can tell you, it's only going to get worse. I, I don't understand <clears throat> the Permit Extension Act that you referred to. That resulted in an extension of the permit that we thought had expired? Yes. So doesn't that make the permit that we voted to issue moot? In which Not case, Mr. Gerson? This most current one? Yeah. No, because that the permit that was revived has since expired. Mm -hmm. Permit oh, extension, so there's, there's an extension. Right. Right. Okay. Okay. So, yeah. I think there were actually two different permit extension acts that they passed. Right. It was really 
The act, the, the act in all honesty was really designed for these companies that had these big developmental projects going on that had invested millions of dollars in developing projects, but it applied to every kind of permit you could ever get. But the very original permit was games, no practice. No, the original permit was everything, provide us a traffic study, park up on the road, and walk down Island Pond Road. And so the second time we met, we didn't think those conditions would be met in good faith, and we came up with those other conditions, one of which was no practices during the week. That, those conditions and that permit was, because of the extension of the, the other, that those weren't really viable. We didn't know it, but the punch weren't viable. So now it's as though, jump ahead and the extension is over and we're back talking about the same thing. In theory, I guess we, we could be talking about the first permit and about parking up at the road and carpooling and all that sort of thing. I have a problem with the procedure. Um, I, I mean, as John said, we, we had a fairly lengthy hearing, heard from a lot of people, there was a lot of discussion, and there was a vote. I personally thought the vote was too restrictive. I didn't quite agree with it, but nonetheless, the board took the action, and. I don't see the basis for opening it up and having another hearing tonight, other than the fact that the applicant would like that to happen, and I can understand that, but I don't know how we do that without hearing again from all the neighbors and basically rehearing the whole thing and issuing another decision. And what's the, I mean. Well, I think the, the, the new information is. Which is what? One is the applicant, you know, didn't like their response, which oh, okay. we understood that. But but two is that the the permit that we were referring to wasn't a valid permit, and so that was information we didn't have. Um, it doesn't seem like a substantial change. To me. I mean, it doesn't change what happened. It doesn't change the compliance. It doesn't change what we perceive to be a traffic problem or not. It doesn't change any of that. But right. legally, certainly, we we weren't uh, in the place that we thought we were. And just to explain, um, you know, about the process, there there were based, there are two options, and <coughs> the city certainly supported the applicant coming forward with a request for for this um, um, settlement because they had already filed the appeal. So, from the city's perspective, it's um, it could potentially resolve an issue um, before having to go to court and expend resources down that path. Right. So um, it made sense, and it was sort of our recommendation that you know that that's one way to do it. And um, if if it made sense, there was additional information they could pitch the argument. And then the alternative, obviously, would be to file you know a request for an amendment, which is the same thing. It would be reopening the whole hearing again, um, or just to continue with the court procedure. But you know we're. As a city, we're in the position of trying to find, you know, a middle ground, um, and and not be adversarial. And right. I'm, I'm all for that, and, and and it doesn't make sense just to spite everybody and make, make the city pay for this little legal process and, and not allow kids to play soccer. So I don't think anybody's trying to do that. But I think that second permit, which which wasn't valid was in direct response to what the board thought were conditions that weren't being met. The traffic studies that weren't being issued, weren't being supplied, and the carpooling that wasn't happening, and so forth. And so then we made those conditions, and then when we came back the third time, with the residents are saying, why are you giving them another chance, when the second time they didn't meet two out of three conditions, why are you giving them a second chance? Turns out it's a first chance, because the permit wasn't valid, but, but what was happening was the same that um, this is just this issue hasn't gone away and it hasn't gotten any better and and the soccer boards have rotated through and every new president's been in front of us arguing the same thing which i get um, but on the resident end there's they've seen the same issue and we're trying to figure out a resolution of settlement um, to make everybody happy and this it seems like this is an issue where we can't make everybody happy what about um the per we granted the permit for two years. So 
in the in the nature of trying to come to a reconciliation, we changed that to one year. We're hearing it that often anyway. <laughs> <laughs> you mean you sort of test to see how it goes? Right. So th I, I, would, I would throw that out there to the to the board to consider and get your thoughts on, but I, I would be willing possibly to change that to one year and consider maybe, you know, striking one of these. I, I, I don't, I, I think a schedule could be made available to the neighbors. I don't know that it's that it would, onerous. Well, so what, what I did is I printed out the master schedule for the use of the Expo Fields and I gave it to the city. Mm -hmm. It's it's hard for me because I don't know who lives in the neighborhood. I could certainly get the I list. Know, and isn't that what we? I thought that's all. I thought that met the the intent. I think it was just to have that available that we could post or something and get it on the city website or something. The website or something. But it's also on what's so made available. It's 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 available to the public through the league's website. Anyone can go online and see what games are being played where at any point. Uh, I think that that's. Would satisfy right. you know, publishing think, schedule. Yeah. Right. I don't think yeah. we met for we would go door to door, get everybody's personal phone number or whatever. And we, and we did we did receive that. So. Yeah. Um, and but and I just I'd, I'd like to confirm though it, it doesn't this was a new permit this year, so it doesn't really matter what was on the books or referenced previously because it was a new permit. Right. So if you felt so like those, so, so that felt. Right, so I'm saying even if even if we were responding to the second right, permit, it wasn't really valid. If we, if we go past that and we're responding to the first permit, we're still just as upset you know, from that first right. permit. So, but, um, the, but the one year, though, I think the fall is the heavier season, correct? That's correct. So you probably want to see, you know, at this point it would be a year from now as opposed to, a, you know, August. Because you'd want to see what the fall looks like. Since that's their heavier season, I would think if you were gonna if you were gonna go with the one year. Do, do the Florence Fields are those coming online in the spring? Do you know, that's what I'm told. Yeah. For baseball. Well, <coughs> Just for baseball. Point be of extending it for a year. Would that be to eliminate all soccer after a year, or to add, broaden the permit? Uh, what's Could be the, to open it up again for if if he wanted to come and print, you know file a, a, for a permit again. I mean, and then we would be revisiting. <coughs> you know, a brand new. <laughs> a brand new same thing. Possibly. Well, except you would have had an example of what the permit looks like running through the season. What the intent was before, and I don't know how long we, the permit was before, was it three years? Or it's either two, two or three years. Yeah. Was, you know, at that time, it was the second time through, we said, let's give this a shot, let it run its course. Get feedback from the residents. Get feedback from soccer. See how it went. Well, we got the feedback, and it, and it didn't go well. But one of the things was the conditions weren't met, so it wasn't. We couldn't effectively see how it went because it wasn't a it wasn't, you know, wasn't a true representation of what we what we wanted it to be. So maybe if we do a one year, and maybe this is difficult, and you and we lose Northampton soccer because of it. well, that's not the intent from anybody, but maybe. Instead of waiting two years to lose it, maybe after a year we say this we got to fix something now, or maybe the residents say this is great, we got to keep it. So I, I think that's a good idea. There was a traffic study. Was there a traffic study? There was traffic counts. Traffic, traffic counts, counts, but they but there was contention about when the traffic counts were made, when were they when they were provided or when they weren't provided. So if it were to be, if. And, and, and again, we are in the middle of the season, so I know that's a problem. But I mean, if if we have if traffic is the major issue, which it yes. sounds yes. as if right. it is, then can a good traffic count be done? You've had good traffic counts done. I mean, the city did one at the very beginning. So there have been good traffic counts right. done. Okay. Um, and they weren't done as consistently as the permit required, but they were done. Um, once a year and um, so and those are the numbers that were presented at the last hearing in terms of volume and there certainly isn't a speeding issue um, and you know the the volumes were um, less than a lot of places around most places around the city so I don't know that another traffic okay. is gonna 
that wasn't get true from what I was hearing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, than you already have. So what I'm hearing is that uh, item four maybe could just be reworded to say that a practice schedule needs to be provided to the city and posted on the website. And it would be a one year term instead of two. But we keep item three on the game during the week. One year to expire in August? To expire in the calendar year and get your fall experience. But I'm curious, but I'm, 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 I, don't, I want the recreation department to tell me what the online use of the Florence Fields gives us. I'm disappointed to hear that uh, we effectively only get one soccer field out of that. That doesn't, I'd like to No, I'd like one to additional, one surplus than what we needed. And the, and the other issue is they're going to be rotating the fields because if you pound the fields every single day and they don't get rest, then you ruin your field. So there needs to be days off. Okay, so that so, is something that you agree with that statement that we only get one active. I don't know what the number is. I know that um, originally when um, the rec department director um, said she had to go and look and see how much field um, availability there would be once Lawrence Field comes on, um, that would be allowed. And so I guess it's one I never got a follow up from her. I know their hope was to. to as Carolyn said, rotate them. Where now they don't, they just pound them every one they have. Which is why, which is why it's not as big a net as you would think it would be. Right. right. There's a new practice field at JFK, though. Yes, and that just came on this year, and it's oh, being that, used. It is being used. Yes, it is. The Bear Hill. Bear Hill. That's so not that a full size field, is it? Mm -hmm. I don't even think it's a full modified size field. It's just basically a big green space. Yeah, but it's good for practice. Sure, right? absolutely. Um, so that can, and there have been practices there. So that's been helping, I think. And that was one of the things they tr tried to pull together in response to not being able to, to practice right. at the Oxbow. Uh, one more thing, just to, I remember when we first heard this, there was a soccer team that was practicing. Western United. That was Western United. Yeah. And is that? They practice at Lusitano and Ludlow now. Uh, should we hear from residents? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I live um, on Island Road, and um, I just want just to make a for the record. Catherine Zukowski. And with all due respect, I haven't heard anything that's new here. I mean, I know that there was the, the permit thing with the two years, but that doesn't change anything. So I, I don't think that it's like flagging a dead horse is what it feels like. So that's one point I wanted to make. Um, and I just wanted to respond to the piece about um, shifting the traffic to other places in the city. I think that's good. Like why, why do we have to bear all of that? And I think that necessity is the mother of invention and if you know maybe those grass plots that people are practicing on now maybe those do become fields or you know maybe there is a stronger push if quote unquote it's only going to get worse you know if there's a i mean soccer is great there's going to continue to be a growing need but i didn't buy my house on island road with the conditions with the soccer that we've had so it's, it feels like the rug got pulled from out of me. You know, it's like, I didn't buy into that. And I just want to um, read here, going back to the original permit, um, that the open space, section 81 C and D, the open space and recreation plan calls for more fields to be created for recreational uses. These fields, meaning the Oxbow fields, this is when we first granted the two-year permit, these fields, fields serve to fill a gap in the need for playing fields for youth soccer. The original permit was issued as a stopgap measure because there was such a need. And then more fields were supposed to be found, more land, and that, that that happened. So according to this permit, this this was going to expire once there was more land. 
So I'm not saying I want soccer to go away completely. It was fine the way it was way back when I bought my house 10 years ago. So I don't know what the answers are, but that's my piece. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, can I ask you a question? What? I think Mr. Taylor said at the last hearing that soccer has been played at about the same level of activity there going back many years. Is that not correct? I, there were two small fields when I first bought the house, and it spiraled out of control and where it's at right now since we we just had the last meeting a few months ago the traffic is is palpably so much better it's i just it's it's it feels like it's almost what it used to be so the amount of soccer that was played in recent years in the last whatever five years is substantially more than oh, was yes. in earlier yes, yes, years? Yes, without a doubt. Without a doubt. There's more fields there now than we so. Is there anybody else from the public has anything new to add to the argument that we haven't heard before? Yeah, I, you, I don't know if you've heard this before because I wasn't there before, but just to, um, our children played at the Oxbow and the same arguments were going on. This was 25 years ago. Um, and I don't know what, and they reached some traffic calming solutions with the neighbors. I don't know if they were actual, we have much more um, infrastructure now for traffic calming all over the city, but I didn't know if that had been a consideration. Um, but the same level of concern was in existence 20 years ago. Yep. Yep. My name is Christopher Martin. I also live on Island Road. Um, I just want to, I don't know if this is necessarily new information, but because this point was brought up earlier, I feel like I can address it. Um, I want to point out that, you know, in, in the traffic study, and I haven't read it, so I don't know exactly what it says, but I'm wondering if they were really uh, evaluating similar sorts of streets. In the two years I've lived in Northampton, I've driven around quite a bit. I'm a builder. I work in lots of different places around the town. I don't know very many streets that are essentially one-lane streets. And Island Road is essentially a one-lane street. Even when there's no one parked along Island Road, we often have to wait for an oncoming car in order to move down the street in a safe, reasonable way. I mean, we're not talking about being paranoid. We're not talking about anything like that. It's a very, very narrow street with a very extreme blind corner on it with lots of hedges around it. It's a difficult street. The houses are often only a few feet away from the road. There's lots of little children that live along the street. There's huge visibility problems there. And I'm just wondering, like, does the traffic study really take into account the actual character of that street? Um, and the other piece of, that I would like to bring to your attention was that um, the soccer evening practices or games that take place down at the Oxbow are right at the peak traffic time for the street. I mean, there are 20 something houses along Island Road most of whom house working people who are coming and going at five to six o'clock in the evening, trying to get back to their house, trying to get dinner, trying to get their kid home from school, trying to get out for something later in the evening. I mean, this is peak traffic time on our road for the residents who live there. So the fact that the tr soccer traffic is also happening at that time of day is a, a huge inconvenience. I mean, it's not unusual to wait for three or four cars to pass before you can actually make it down my road. And you know, it's like, this is the condition I moved in there with. I know that that's the case, but it's, it's not like any other street. You know, like, there's a few streets in Northampton where there's a lot of cars parked along the road and you often have to wait for people to come and go. But it's, it's really not a typical street for the town. And I suspect that the traffic study didn't really take into account the character of this particular road. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, any other comments from the board? I, mean, I, I think I, I don't I don't look at this as a as a legal issue whether the permit was valid or not the reason we put the conditions on the permit were, were real um, and as that permit lapsed 
everything that was open has lapsed, then I, I think the conditions are still as real as they were before. Um, I, I like your idea about, you know, I think before we were frustrated because conditions weren't being met, so we said two years, two fields, that's it. But maybe <coughs> with a nod toward what Mark is saying and, and what this, what could happen because of this, maybe we go from two to one years. Um, but I would say go through the next fall season to get a, a true example of, you know, both calendar year. Um, and then maybe by then, the traffic's better. It seems like it's better now. And maybe by then we find another field or maybe they, the rotation of the fields in the spring when they come on and plus you add the one at, at JMK, maybe that helps. You know, we, we don't know. Um, but I'd be inclined to, to, to settle on that. I don't know if that will, will one year with what happening during the week? Same conditions, same conditions as we had, just one year instead of two. And a modification and to the fourth. Mm -hmm. Correct, as far as notification of the, of the game schedule. <coughs> and maybe we'll make a difference, maybe the appeal still goes through and the city has to fight it, which isn't, doesn't help anybody. So no, no change to practices during the week? Mm -hmm. Correct. So change the wording in four to just you know notify the city, I guess, in the manner which it's been done, um, and reduce the permit from two to one year. Um, I just want to clarify on the notify the city. Um, I thought I heard before that somebody said, well, the city can post it on the website. We can't. I don't think we can post. We can post maybe a link somewhere, but we can't right. post. Mm -hmm. You know, someone else's yes, stuff right. on the city webpage. Right, right. So, I mean, we would put it in our, we have an online file, so it, where everything from every permit goes, so people can access that. <laughs> but I just want to clarify yeah, that. Yeah. I'm not reading no, it. I mean, as we're going to go find everybody's stuff. And I would think they wouldn't come looking for it on your planning site, they'd go looking for it at the rec site. Right. Well, that's what I'm saying. Right, but again, it's not rec department's duty right. to post another clubs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I guess the only the comment I would make would be, we're getting a true picture of a fall season right now. So, well, you know, I, I, I guess I would just say, why can't we just cut it to one year and it would be next August and before the fall season, we'd have this conversation again because we're, we're seeing it now you know, instead of having, so because we waited until, you know, then we'd have two fall seasons. Yeah, and, uh, so this was mid-July? This was mid yeah. Yeah, yeah, July 15th was where they stamp it, so. So I, I know, that would give you one full spring-fall experience, and then I guess we'd have this conversation again mm -hmm. next summer. <laughs> As waiting. opposed to two summers. As opposed to two summers. Right. Right. And, which also, but I think Mark makes a good point, you know, the, the purpose here isn't to, you know, isn't, you know, a, a, uh, scorched earth policy it's you know we're trying to find a solution that works for both parties and, and so one full year of experience we would have that i guess that would also encompass the um, ultimate tournament uh that occurred <laughs> uh, that has nothing to do with soccer um and then you know then we can reassess you know i mean that that would you know just if you're talking july you're giving them enough time to try to create a season schedule if you wait too late then that it, that would be a problem. So I would be clear that it ought to, the decision ought to be made in time for that to happen. Can I just throw out one? I mean, the issue here. I'm not. Sh I think one of the bigger issues was about the games versus practices. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, we have a dearth of practice fields, and practice happens during the week for the most part. Games are typically you know, are more right. prevalent on the weekend. So would it make sense to even, as part of the trial, allow some practice, you know, maybe it's limited to the number of nights during the week or fields? Um, because in the, this is saying no practices at all, but we obviously know that teams need to practice, all teams need to practice during the week. Would it be time. possible to just have one field open to both any time? Mm -hmm. I mean, you get your practice, you get your game, but you definitely limit the number of people that are down there. 
And we talked about that last time about instead of saying no games, we just we limit the fields from four to two and what they do on the field is up to them. How many field I wasn't here for that last we're time. Four. How many were four being actively used? Yes. I mean, were there ever four being used at one time? Yes. Yeah. Oh, well, but if I two would make a big summer. difference. So we've already narrowed it. But we narrowed, yeah, we narrowed it, and then, and then on top of that, we said no practice, practice during the week. Yeah. But you know, potentially you could say, okay, practice, but mm -hmm. only two days a week or something. Right, or Wednesdays mm -hmm. only. Yeah. No, no practice during the week. These right. kids mostly practice two days a week, if I understand correctly. So practicing, and if you're going to allow practice, practicing two days a week means that your schedule is in the same place, I would think. So maybe one day a week is, is half of what it was. And it, it sounds like this was no fun for Mark and the club oh, yeah. to get through this fall, but they muddled through, or they're gonna get through somehow, some way. But if they have to do this again, then it's, not, it's no good. But they got through. But maybe in the spring, when the other fields come online and JFK's there, maybe still no fun, but it's a little easier. Or maybe if we say, one practice a week, whereas before they practice twice a week. Now we can say, all right, once a week. Maybe that's. Or can you have week. one field open during the week and two on the weekends? Well, we have. They can practice on the weekend. Right, but, and just so you know, nobody practices on the weekend. Right, yeah. right. We allow it, but they don't do it. Yeah. And practice out. So. I guess. I guess my feeling again. I'll go back to, uh, you know, 90 days ago, barely. You know, we took this vote, we considered everything, all the permits were, had expired. We came up with what we thought was a fair resolution based on all the history and everything. And it's almost like, you know, we're, and we knew that there, you know, there's a experimental component of this. Mm -hmm. Well, if we're doing an experiment, it seems we ought to let the experiment go, <laughs> then assess it. But if we change it in the middle, then we don't, you know, because what I'm hearing is, at least for one of the parties, it's working right. and it is palpably better. So I understand that places the burden on the soccer club, but we're going to have more information in the spring. We're going to have more fields. I don't know. I guess I'm worried that if we start changing it in the middle, then we don't, you know, we kind of don't know what, if we have a good outcome, we don't know what caused the good outcome. Was it the extra fields? Was it the change right. in practice? So I, I guess, again, I, I, the board and spent so a lot of time 90 days ago making a decision. I understand that that may put a burden on the city, but. You know, that's what the city gets paid to do. So if they want to settle. If they drag out the appeal process through the next fall soccer season, mm -hmm. then we'll have them. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> so, but I, you know, I, I guess again, I mean, as a public body, I mean, we we just, you know, it's you know, just 90 days ago we made this. So, would you be a proponent yeah. of, of changing it to one year, leaving everything else the same? So, just, I, I would be tough end to kind of cut to the chase. Uh, if I can finish. Sure. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I would. You know, I, I think Carl was suggesting I mean, it gives you one full year to assess both fall and spring, and you know, and then we go from there. I mean, I, 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 I would agree yeah. to that that alteration. And I, and I appreciate your mm. your thoughtful conversation, but if those are the conditions that you're going to impose, we really don't have any chance but to continue the lawsuit because the condition that we need is two fields is fine, but we need to be able to use those fields for either games or practice during the week and on weekends. And it doesn't sound like the board's inclined to do that. Um, and so it, it is what it is at this point. I have a question. Yep. You talk about the experimental component, but, and I'm a disinterested. I'm partner. sorry, are you recording this? It's a public meeting. It's, it's illegal to record voices without giving the express permission to people in Massachusetts. It's actually a criminal act. And so if you're recording this, meetings are always on TV. Recorded. No, you have to announce that you're recording the meeting, and I, you're not allowed to record the meeting without permission of people. Okay, I'm not recording. My question is, as a disinterested party, just listening to the discussion, you mentioned an experimental component, but what are your measurements of its success? You know, what are, what are the... Is there some kind of objective assessment that's going to take place at the end of this experiment to decide whether the permit works or you have to go back? I, I think I, I was just making an analogy that not changing things in midstream. Yeah. So. I think ultimately, if we 
figure out a way for the soccer club to continue and thrive and the residents are happier now than they were two years ago, then that's a successful outcome. Well, and I think that the answer would be we would continue to run traffic counts and we would hold another hearing when we bring it up again. I, I also I'm not comfortable with the, with the process of coming to a decision, kind of being threatened with a lawsuit, and then having to, to rehear things again. I, it just feels like it sets a bad precedent. For the, for the I, I, so I, I'm, I, I, I think Carl's suggestion is a good one, and I would recommend adopting that and modifying the language to item four as far as notification, but nothing else. So everything stays the same except for four? And, the, and change the two years to one year. Um, okay, to, now to December. So I, I think John's got a point. If we go to mid-July, that's a year. That's a fall season, a spring season. So they'll know coming out of spring whether they, it's going to work or not. So you would modify number one too, so that it goes to July or August fifth. Same thing, August fifth. Yeah. yeah. Keep it the same, but 2015. Yeah, correct. How does everybody else feel? We need a, a motion or just a, okay. What's the jump in? Make a motion. <coughs> help me with the, the wording, Carolyn. Uh, make a motion to am amend the permit that was issued to um, expire in one year and to amend condition number four um, to, to delete condition number four or to. Hang on, let me try that again. Condition number four would be that uh, the league schedule needs to be available online. Or submitted to the city. Right. We have a motion, need a second. John, second. Any discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Is that an opposed? No. Okay. All right, thank you, everybody. This is a tough one. We'll try and see how it goes. Thank you so much thank you. for all your time. Thank you. Thank you. In the spring markets will all be better. Mark, what's the cutoff for age of where the kids playing at Book Park? I mean, I know the little kids. So they're under. The, the thing is, it all kind of melts together nowadays. They start when they're 11 and 12 playing. The city's program starts playing across from all sports, across from the fairgrounds. And then the league we play in goes down to under 8 So it's really kind of All right, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I was the only note on the entire, so I thought. I was I Everybody, we still have one more hearing. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're a full hour behind. Uh, but maybe that's not so bad. Um, so the last uh, hearing we have scheduled for tonight, scheduled for eight o'clock. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Come on in. Squeeze it. Scheduled for eight o'clock. This is request by Phillips Place LLC for second line approval construct a two-unit structure for a total of four units at 51 Phillips Place, Northampton, Map ID 32A-201, as published on September 25th and October 2nd. Okay. So, open the 
hearing and we have a presentation of sorts. Yes, uh, just a quick slideshow to give you the basics of the project. My name is Linda Murley and my husband and I own uh, 51 Phillips Place. We purchased it last year uh, at the end of the year. Um, it's currently, the existing house uh, is currently under construction, uh, being renovated into a two-family. And uh, we are asking that we be allowed to build a second building with a, uh, another uh, two, fam two units in it. There's nobody in it now, right? There's no need. Mm -hmm. we it. Click on the uh, up. There's a <laughs> right down in the bottom where it says 39 percent. Go to the next thing left. Up. Are you want to start the slideshow? Yes. <laughs> um, go up to slideshow on the menu. <laughs> Kevin, you want to man this? <laughs> <laughs> Top row. No, no, no. Up. Oh. I think he's back on it. Way up at the time. Yeah. 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 Under, under Microsoft. Right there where it says slideshow. Oh. Yeah. Oh. And then just from the Yeah. Oh, yeah. There you go. There you go. Oh, there we go. All right. So, so, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Because the project is, uh, the new building will be more than 2,000 square feet and intermediate site plan is required. Um, so we are here. And I make it look I knew that. <laughs> <laughs> I am an architect and a small developer. I do, um, I typically take old buildings in the city that are falling apart and I renovate them and, and bring them back to life. So this was actually one of the first projects we did. It's over on um, Orchard Street. It was a two family, uh, two side by side townhouses. Um, and This one is 90 Pomeroy Terrace, the one that I've just finished. We just sold the last unit, uh, closed on it a couple of months ago. Um, it's a six family. Um, it was owned by the Kahn's family for many years. Uh, it has a variety of living spaces in it, and uh, we lived in it ourselves, actually, for a while. This is the site on Phillips Place. Um, you can see the existing house. and. We've sort of ghosted in what the new building will be like and what the presence on the street will look like. And you currently own the existing, or yes. re are renovating the existing? Currently, yes. Okay. At the end, I have some uh, photos of that as well, just to give you a, a little bit of an idea. So this is a um, street view of the project site. The building itself, the existing house, is located on one corner, the northeast corner. Um, it at one time stretched all the way to the back. Uh, there was an attached barn that was torn down about 10 years ago. Uh, so the um, west side of the site is, is very open. This is the uh, basically the location map. Lovely location, walking distance to the city. Zoom in to the, to the site itself. Uh, the little white building, that, that's just a trailer. That's actually the structure. Uh, it's URC zoning, uh, very close to um, the uh, CB zoning, just less than a block away. That's the property itself. And you can see, um, this is one of the city maps, um, the, the structures around it um, are all period houses and they all are different styles. And they're all very beautiful. And in fact, in the last year and a half, um, there have been s some renovations done in some of the buildings painting. And this it's really remarkable that there's one on the corner across from us that's now um, being painted as well. So the, that half of the block is really ch changing how it looks. Um, this, the existing site uh, is 12,097 square feet. Frontage is 123 plus some inches, it's 99 feet deep, one building, lot coverage about 34%, and uh, it was a single family residence, but we already hold the permit, as we said, in our under construction to turn the existing house into two family. Uh, one part of what we are doing in the construction is, it was a very, uh, the house is in very poor shape, 
but the back of it was unsalvageable, so we had to take off the back of it, and we put an addition of about the same size back on and turn that into a garage, an attached garage with living space above it. So there'll be one garage and three surface parking spaces. Um, what we're proposing, what we're proposing, the, obviously the frontage doesn't change, the depth doesn't change. Two buildings, our lot coverage would go from 34% to 59%. Um, and we'd go from two units to four units. And the living area would go from 2950 to 6950. Um, there would be five garages and three surface parking spaces for a total of four units. Um, what's required um, uh, under the current zoning um, to do what we want to do is a minimum of 50 foot um, frontage, 10,000 <coughs> per feet or 2,500 per unit, and we're doing four, so we'd need a minimum of 10,000. Lot coverage can be up to 70%, four units allowed. Maximum height is 50 feet, and um, we would require eight parking spaces. So here we are, again, we have uh, 12,000 plus square feet. We have more than twice the frontage required, um, satisfactory depth. Um, I put setbacks in here, the setbacks required are 10, 10 front, 10 side, and 20 rear. Um, and we meet all of those. Uh, the side setback, actually working with Carolyn, we've set the building back a little bit more from, from the, the new building from the property line, it would be abutting. Um, our lot coverage is 59% with the new building. We we'll have four units, and the height of the buildings is about 25 feet. And as I said before, five garages and three <coughs> spaces uh, for a total of eight spaces. Each unit would have one garage and one surface parking space, with the exception of one unit that would have um, a two-car two garage <coughs> and uh, no surface parking space. So this is the site again. Um, we are reusing the existing driveway. Um, that's the existing residence and the site of the, of the new building. This is looking at it from the northeast corner. This building on the right-hand side directly across is one of the ones that's been uh, fully renovated. It's really beautiful now, multifamily. Um, this is looking at it from the northwest corner of the site. And is that your neighbor's driveway? That's the neighbor's driveway, which actually the next slide is partly my driveway. <laughs> 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 because it crosses the property line. Um, so that, <coughs> that issue is yet to be addressed. Uh, this is from within the site, looking towards the west property, and that drive, that big driveway we just saw and then looking towards the corner and across the street. This property, all the properties on this street, I believe, without exception, are all multifamily, and most are at least four, um, and some are more than that. The site on the other side, Excuse next door. Excuse me, that's not the case. Mm -hmm. No? Yeah. Yeah. No. We, we live across the street. Yeah. I live in a single family. Let's, yeah. let's let the hearing go through, and then we'll take questions. Okay. Um, this, is looking, this is looking to the rear of the site. Um, there's a house, uh, that's actually the garage, there's a house behind and uh, that property has a, a fence along there. There's quite uh, dense vegetation. Uh, these are some of the other houses um, on the street. Uh, this is the one, the lower <coughs> right hand corner is the one that's directly across the street. Uh, these are on the north side of the street. And these are the, these are the houses that are on the south side of the street adjacent to uh, 51 Phillips. So this is the neighbor to the right hand side as you face the site and you can see Phillips Place in the distance there. And the upper right hand corner is, uh, shows the neighbor to the left hand side which is actually a corner lot that wraps around behind 51 Phillips and I believe it has two structures. I think it has a third structure uh, on it as well. This is uh, the existing uh, house. Um, it looks a little bit different now, but this is the condition it was in when we bought it. Uh, this is the condition of the back and sides of it when we bought it. Um, it was lacking a lot of care. This is the, the uh, existing site plan and location of the uh, 
currently what's being turned into a two-family. And this shows the new building, its location on the site and the setbacks. You can see we're using the existing driveway. The garages will be uh, off of that driveway, all of them, and all of the parking will be as well. Mark, I'm, I'm sorry, can I, yeah. does, does Linda know that we have, all have these plans and have looked at them? I do know that you have them, yes. I, I, do you want me to go faster? So do you, we have the plans. The presentation, obviously, we, we don't have. So we have this information isn't isn't yeah. new to us. Okay. But for those who don't have the plans, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. 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 So there was so right. somebody in particular yeah. asked right. me that's here in the audience. Yep. Yeah. Uh, these are the floor plans. On the left hand side is the first floor plan, and the right is the second floor. These units are each about 2,000 square feet. Um, they have a first floor master uh, and three bedrooms upstairs. Uh, a second master upstairs, so there's a master down and a master up. Um, it's a very popular um, style. We've had a lot of feedback that first floor masters are, are hard to find and very important uh, for a, a, a number of types of families, actually. This is uh, what the elevation of the new building will be. The top is the front and the bottom is the back. Uh, the units, uh, the two units in the new building, one unit faces the street and the other unit faces the back, so those are their front doors. Uh, these are the sides, so the, the top elevation faces the existing building and is on the driveway, and you can see that's where the garage doors would be, and the elevation on the bottom faces the adjacent property owner, and um, in my application I had mentioned wanting to preserve um, a concrete grapevine that I understand has been on the site for 160 years. So I intend to replant it. This is close to the location of where it currently is, but the, the, the columns on this face include a trellis and that's where the grapevine would be transplanted to grow up and over. This is what the new street elevation would look like. This is the existing building. Uh, the porch is a little bit different because it is also in not good repair, so we'll be making some changes and repairs to it. The bulk of it will remain. And then this would be the elevation of the new building next to it and the driveway in between. Um, it was important to me to keep the character of the property so that it felt like it was all one project and that it was respectful of the existing house and how it faced the street. This house, by the way, has a um, a, a very unusual, I, I, I'm told it's the first one that, uh, the only one that's been seen in Northampton is a floating stair, stair that winds up uh, without support, without visible support. These are details of the front and uh, <coughs> front unit and back unit entries. Uh, in order to, to comply with all the setback requirements um, and the requirement for covered porches, we've We've, we've created basically what I'm defining as a stoop. So there would be a couple of steps. You'd step up, there's a wood, wood deck, and then you come under cover and the front door is under cover. And similar situation at the back. Uh, this is the, the actual grapevine and a picture of the trellis um, that we'd be looking to, to replant it, to grow on. And then this is, the final slide is of, um, some pictures I just took this week of the building itself. We are, it took us until now to um, fix the structural problems. It was, it was really not in good shape. So we've done all of that. It took quite a bit more than we thought. Um, we've sort of rebuilt it, I think, piece by piece. And uh, we've, we're now on the outside and in the next month it will change dramatically. Uh, the, the siding will all have been ins installed. The windows are going in right now. The roof, new roof is going on right now. And uh, the painter is due to start in a day, so um, it'll look quite different. Uh, this side porch is the entrance to the second unit that we've created inside the house. And that's... Do you want to maybe keep the site plan up? What's that? Do you want to keep the site plan up? Sure. This one? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the next one is the other one. Yeah, there yeah. you go. Um, any questions by the board? 
Um, yeah, I've got a couple. Um, have you have you figured out a way to save any of the trees? What's the story with the trees that are the trees are uh, um, many of the trees are about as old as the house. They're very old. Um, so there's two trees. I did have an arborist study done, which I believe you know, we have that. Idea. We have it. Oh, yeah, we have it. Um, <laughs> there's, there's a number of valuable trees, and there's a number of, in what the arborist stated, were sort of invasive, invasive species. Um, we're taking out one tree. Essentially, we're taking out one tree that's in the middle of the site that's actually not a tree, it's an overgrown bush. The arborist didn't know what it was. Um, it's in very bad shape. And there's one fir tree at the back edge of the site that is in very poor shape. It's very large, and it's in danger of coming down. So he rec recommended we take that down. But um, everything else is being retained. In fact, all the other site landscape is being retained. What else got? That's it. What about a sidewalk in the front? Uh, the sidewalk, there is a sidewalk that comes up to the site, I know. and then it stops. I know. And in fact, the curb is missing from a big chunk of that area, too. So it's it's kind of a funny, it's like sort of You're a... You're not planning on putting a sidewalk? Um, well, that's not my property, but I would certainly, you know, I, I don't quite know how we'd go about that. We'll have to, the curb will have to be repaired um, in order to define the, the, the existing driveway and to repay that because um, it's cracked and falling apart. Um, so it, it should have a sidewalk there. Well, you, I mean, the board often requires upgrades, particularly if it stops. I didn't it realize stops. it stopped right it's there. A, it's a tarmac for the type sidewalk. Length and it stops. Yeah, yeah, it's it the length stops. of the property oh, okay. sidewalk, and many times it's on city property, but you would build it to according to the DPW standards. Yeah, the only thing that I would be concerned about is that there are two trees, two existing trees that, are, that show on the site plan, and that's where, that's right where the sidewalk would go. Right. So I, you know, we'd have to just look at that and see how we could make that work. I wouldn't want which, to. On which side of the property does the sidewalk? At, um, you, can, you can see on the right-hand side, e, the east sidewalk, that's where it ends. Okay. Just short of the property. Can I clarify something? There is no sidewalk except for that corner. Right, on that's, yeah. On that side of the street. There is no sidewalk. At all. For the entire. For the, for the entire, entire street. Right. Yeah. It's only the, the property on the corner. Is there any on the other oh, side? Let's, yeah. yes. let's so. keep this, hold on. Before we, I'm, I'll open this up to the public in a second. I thought it was just to, a point yeah. of information. <laughs> Who was that hand? That was you. That was me. Anybody yeah. else? Um, Len, are you are you familiar with the recommendations that the planning department staff has made? <clears throat> A recommendations for, for, for recommendations. relative to the permit about surveying boundaries. Yes. Um, yes. Being, yes. Dealing with the trees. Um, a, a fence in the back. Yeah, I would like to talk about the fence a little bit, um, but the trees, we've submitted the arborist report, that's what I intend to follow through on, um, and the uh, surveying, um, I'm happy to have the surveyor come out when we're ready to excavate and set the points, the corners of the building. I think that makes a lot of sense. I think my contractor would be very happy. You recommended before issuing the building permit, though, right? Right. So that would have to be before excavating. Well, it would be very unusual to do that because until there's an actual project, it wouldn't make sense to hire a surveyor to place a, the pins for a building that hasn't been approved. But it, I would certainly, certainly agree to do it. Okay. But I, I'd have to know I have a project. Right. And w what about the, well, just the more money you'd spend up front? But if I had a project. Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, the pro it would be after this permit's issued, so you would, the planning board would have, I mean, the, the order would be just before you file your building permit. So if the planning board's issued a permit, you have a project. Right. What, what that about makes a the, certain amount of sense. What about the fence? Um, well, I, I'm a little confused about where the fence would want to be. Um, and I'm concerned about what that would do to 
uh, the snow overflow area. I would prefer to put in, I always prefer landscaping. I prefer to put in deciduous uh, shrubs or trees or something to fulfill that requirement. Um, but if the board feels that that's something that has to happen, then a fence is what will go in. Um, my recommendation about the fence was just because the parking is, um, area is so close to the edge of the property um, that it would prevent snow from being plowed off property um, and um, sort of just create um, a headlight um, barrier here if it's a three foot fence and then wrap it around to this point so again snow doesn't get plowed over to this property. Um, and that there's a, and there may not be room to plant anyway um, along here because there's so little room, yeah, mm -hmm. to the property line. Um, in order to do to build a fence there, we would have to take out more landscaping and trees. Then um, maybe I can go back to the. It's very, very, and and the other side is even denser with trees and, and bushes and things like that. Um, and there's also an exist, existing fence that's right on the property line that would have to be removed. But we can do that. What are your plans for snow removal or snow storage? There's a spot that's shown. Yes, there's two spots shown. Uh, this, the uh, southwest corner and the southeast corner. And it's, it's, in my experience, especially after having dealt with Pomeroy and the snow pond there, it's, that's a more than adequate space. That's probably twice as much space as uh, they use to deposit the snow from this whole last winter uh, over at Pomeroy Terrace. There was a lot more space where they could have put it, but the snow plow, people don't move it very far. They, you know, they'll just stack it up just off the, you know, the end of both of those. Uh, parking spaces there and if it's a really a truly terrible winter and there's no space then we would just have to have it taken off site so we could have a, a condition that there's eight spaces or five outside on the play outside that they would those would be maintained during winter so they, the three outside the three outside so they don't end up to be snow storage right oh they would have to be oh yes I, I, they, it, in dealing with selling these units. <laughs> it would be an attorney issue if right. I did not maintain those. Are you ready for comments? Not yet. Any other uh, questions from the board? No. Okay, so we're going to open this up. Uh, I guess we're set on the, And then we're going to open this up to the public. You can raise your hand. I'll call on you if we get your name and your address. And we'll go from there. Uh, thank you. Hi, my name is Francisco Palomo. I live across the street at 42 Phillips Place. I see a number of problems with this Can project. Can you speak up, please? Yes. My name is Manuel Francisco Palomo Garriga. I live at 42 Phillips Place, directly across the street from this. I see a number of problems with this project. First of all, I would point out that there was that picture that showed the uh, Phillips Place. It must have been taken on a weekend because Phillips Place uh, normally Monday through Friday becomes the parking lot for downtown. You heard people from Island Road speak about how only one car can pass at a time. That is Phillips Place because cars fill up the street from Same. nine to five, both sides, number one. Number two, Phillips Place is also the truck detour for trucks that go down Route 9 and decide to come up on the overpass and can't make it, there are big signs that route them to go down Holly and then up Phillips. All right, and so uh, come winter when there's snow and both sides of the street are filled, um, I'm waiting for the next car that gets smashed by a semi going through. Therefore, I have tremendous trepidation about having additional units with additional cars crowded into this very narrow, very overcrowded street. A second issue that I have with this problem is 
Could you flash to that photograph where you showed your neighbor's yard and your, your dotted line over it, please? Yes, yeah, that's fine. I'm not sure which one. The one that, that showed the, the, the arrow, driveway. With the arrow, the driveway. That, with that right there, mm -hmm. okay. All right. Have you heard of eminent domain? Okay. I happened, before moving to 42 Phillips Place, I lived at this address when I rented it before we, um, before we bought the house. This is 37 Phillips Place. We moved in there in 1982. This driveway already existed in 1982. And I believe that the previous owner of 37 Phillips Place had put in that driveway sometime before. That says to me that uh, by uh, adverse possession, the property line at a minimum for 37 Phillips Place is encompassed by this because this was the clearly adverse. And so to the extent that setback you're ex expecting to go out to here, that's not going to happen because 37 Phillips Place, by adverse possession, now owns right up to the grass. Ultimately, that's a legal question. That's, that's not our. Legal. That's not our. But but that, but, but, that, but point that, taken. That, that that cuts into the available space and service. The last thing I want to make is there was I, I heard you commenting about whether or not a survey was done. I'm somewhat taken aback that it hasn't happened because I watched surveyors setting up on my sidewalk making a very accurate survey of the property across the street. I even asked them, what are you doing? Oh, we're doing a survey of 51 Phillips Place. So I believe a surveyors have already come in. The, the, the issue was, what wasn't whether or not it's been done, it's that the, the stakes for the building had to be placed before the permit yeah. would be issued. But at, at this point, that's a real issue in terms of how much space there really is because um, that driveway's been there for over 20 years, all right? It was there when I lived at 37 Phillips <laughs> Place in 1982. It, and it, it might be an issue, but it's not a, a yeah, planning board issue. Well, so we, but can't, we can't respond to that. No, no, but it, it, you have to respond in the sense that if she is counting a certain amount of square footage of the lot, but if the square footage doesn't exist, then, then the whole plan falls apart. My main concern is the street is already overcrowded uh, and it does not require additional units. Already it's going to have go from a single family house to a two family house. I could live with that. That's the old Turcotte home and it could definitely uh, stand to be fixed up. But to then have additional units added in is going to be create a totally uh, burdensome situation. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Um, my name is Jane Potter. I live at 42 Phillips Place, and I would just like to add to that. Um, this whole area is right now, and I'm working with Sarah Lavalley on it being um, proposed as an historic district. There are no garages on the street right now. Um, the other thing is, in addition to being the downtown parking lot and the truck route, um, we've had complaints from UPS. They can't get through to deliver things. Our postal route has just changed because the post office delivery people can't park on the street. Um, <clears throat> and in addition to the double-sided traffic and the truck route, um, there's also a warming kitchen at the end of the street at the Pomeroy Church um, and a constant flow of traffic during that time for um, homeless people going up and down the street, both walking and otherwise. I think probably most important to understand is that this is an area of really old houses, but most of them have been subdivided and parking was never taken into account during those subdivisions. So there is um, no adequate parking for the people who already live on the street. I think I can say for myself that twice a week I have to call the police to get people towed so that I can get out of my own driveway. Um, so we really worry about adding any more volume to the street. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Thanks. Um, my name is Jim Nash, 18 Montfield. So my first question is, if we're adding 4,000 square feet, is this special permit or a site plan? This is site plan. Because my understanding of the new zoning is that anything over 2,000 square feet needs to go through special permit. 
It's site plan, as it's always been. Anything over 2,000 square feet is site plan. But I thought anything over 2,000, so I thought it was site plan for adding up to 2,000 square feet, and then anything over 2,000 square feet was, uh, went to special permit. No, the only thing that triggers special permit um, right now are the number of units, not this. So that's gonna be under the new zoning that's about to go through? Or where did the 2,000 square feet come from? No, 2,000 has always been in the zoning ordinance for decades. 2,000 square feet is the threshold for any new construction other than a single family. So it could be in a residential district or a commercial district. Um, any new construction over 2,000 square feet requires a site plan approval. Then at 5,000 square feet, it's a major project in which case you need to um, provide additional information, but it's still um, site plan review. Okay, all right. Um, thanks for clarifying. Um, so I, I just, more so, I, this is more zoning related commentary because this is an infill project that the new zoning is permitting to go forward. So one of the things I, that I, I note about this is that, um, that the proposal is to subdivide the property using the new frontage of 50 feet, whereas there's all of the other properties on the street um, have a frontage of roughly 70 to 100 feet, and that it was recommended by the Zoning Revisions Committee that the, UR, the frontage for URC be set at 65 instead, so that, um, that projects like this, I, 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 I see how, um, the, the developer is, is following the rules here as we set them forward. Uh, but that if you look at the articulation of houses on the street, this doesn't fit in. It's creating a new pattern along the street. And that was one of the reasons the ZRC recommended 65 feet. Um, the other thing is that I, I sense that we're, we're not building an actual four family, we're, we're actually building structures for four units of housing to be sold as condos, correct? Right? Yes, 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 sorry, yeah. yes. Sorry. Uh, yes, and, 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 and we're so, not subdividing. And again, you know, that within the, the zoning, that the new zoning that we've approved, that, you know, the developer is following those rules, but that we're, we're not getting, you know, it's not me adding on some units on my house so I can stay there and rent it out that we, we're inviting a, a, a different type of development to come in. And that, um, that, that I, you know, I, I don't sense that you know, the units that are being sold here are gonna be um, part of you know, having young people you know, on limited incomes to stay in Northampton, uh, which is part of the reason that we're saying we need the infill. And so, I'm not saying stop this, but I'm saying that there are things going on here that we really need to take note of. And that, um, and that there's gonna be more projects like this. There's gonna be projects like this on other streets that aren't, um, that, that we don't, right now, it, it's pretty clear, URC is designated for infill development. But there's also gonna be streets in URB, there's gonna be streets in Florence, there's gonna be streets off of, of Prospect Street and that, that the same consideration be addressed for those properties as well, that, um, that we need to be consistent. So that's my comments. Okay. Can I respond a little bit? Sure. I, I just wanna say that, you know, I appreciate the comments, but you are making a number of assumptions that, that are not correct. So, um, you talk about the kinds of families that are going to be purchasing these units. Well, um, it just so happens that this project, one of these units is for my husband and myself. Um, there's a need not just for uh, families with young children, there's a great need for families whose children are grown like my husband and I and want to downsize and we want to live in the city center and we want to have, you know, to be able to partake of the Northampton city life. And so, we're, we're actually going to be living in one of these units. And we may, in fact, retain more than one unit 
as a rental. So in a sense, we're doing exactly what you were talking about. Somebody who owns a piece of property and wants to add a couple of units to subsidize their mortgage, we are owning this piece of property that we are building a place for ourselves to live and then subsidizing that mortgage by you know, either selling the units or retaining a unit or two to rent. Um, and the second thing I want to mention is that um, we're not subdividing property. So our frontage is, is 123 feet and it, and it remains 123 feet. It, it, it isn't two separate, it isn't becoming two separate properties. Then my question is then the zoning is for attached structures and these, you're creating two structures. My understanding of the new zoning laws is it allows unattached structures, freestanding structures. That That's was one of the major changes. <laughs> well, um, urban residential C is always allowed, um, you know, townhouse projects um, and URB as well, and we define those as two units um, side by side, um, and and there are a minimum of two attached, and up to a series of eight. That was in the old zoning. Mm -hmm. The new zoning allows. Um, um, and would allow by site plan this configuration. So that really hasn't changed in urban residential C at all. We have um, allowed um, in the new zoning to have, and specifically to accommodate um, different kind of configurations for units, but individual units, either single family, two single families that are detached on the same lot, or two twos or two threes, or whatever the unit count. No. Before, can anybody else who hasn't spoken yet? No, okay, go ahead, Len. And, I, I, and, I, and just to finish, um, again, I appreciate the comments about the neighborhood. It's a beautiful neighborhood. Um, I've gotten to know many of the neighbors there um, over the last three or four years as we did, as we renovated um, Nine Palmer Terrace. And we specifically looked for another uh, piece of property in that neighborhood because we like it so much. And um, I think one of the things that, that, I mean, I think it's good to fight for what makes the city a great place. And that's a lot of different things to different people. Um, so it's hard to do. But one of the things that needs to be acknowledged is that buildings like this house, if it was almost anybody else but me that had purchased it, it would have been torn down. Um, it was in, it's, it's over $300,000 just to bring it back to living condition. Not, a, I mean, it's gonna be close to 400 to make it a two family. And so it's hugely expensive. It's much less expensive to just tear these down and build a rectangle and put four units in there. So, um, but, and, and that's, that's allowed. Uh, but I don't do that. And so part of the way that I get to preserve these old buildings is by sharing the cost with the other two buildings. One of, you know, we're gonna live in one of the units. It's, 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 I know it's hard to, we don't like to talk about the economic realities of why, why our housing is the way it is. Um, but, but there is a cost to do all of these things and that's a really wonderful home. And, I, and I'm happy and proud to be able to to fix it up so it can last for another 160 years. Well, I, I appreciate what you're saying, um, but that my that the debate around the, the new zoning has to do not with creating many of the re much of the reasoning with counselors is not so people like you and, and I can stay here. It's so that people who are younger and have less income can find housing. And I. Mm -hmm. Okay, so before I, I'm going to cut this vein of thought short, so it's a little well, technical yeah. zoning okay. conversation. <laughs> yes. But I want to emphasize that but Phillips Place uh, is one of the oldest neighborhoods in Northampton. If you go to the Hampshire Registry of Deeds, you'll find that there is a um, site plan for Phillips Place, which was then a, uh, a dead end, that was filed in 1820. It was the first subdivision created. Pomeroy Terrace did not exist in 1820 when the site plan was filed. My house, 841, uh, 42 Phillips Place, was 
the oldest house on that. But going from the corner of Phillips and Holly, you have uh, the now vacant church. Then you have what used to be a single family house, but now the upstairs is a separate, uh, has a uh, yeah, has a small apartment upstairs, but it's still basically a single family house. No garage. You then have um, the next house, which is a single family house. All right, the Flint's. Then you have the Wolf's house, a single family house. Then you have my house, 42 Phillips Place. Then going beyond that, you have this large Victorian, all right, um, which has been subdivided into separate apartments, you know, six or eight units. And then at the end of the street, at the, at the corner of Phillips and Pomeroy, you have what used to be a single family house, but that's been subdivided into three apartments. If you go to the other side of Phillips Place, uh, you have a house that has a separate detached unit. Then you have 51 Phillips Place, which used to be a single family house. You have 37 Phillips Place, which is a single family house, but it's been subdivided into three apartments, but it's still just one unit. Uh, then you have yeah, yeah, one more house, which is still a, it's, it's still a single family we, house. We have a, a, an overview okay. shot of everything you're saying, All the right. layouts and how many, so. This would be a dramatic change in the character of that street. A dramatic change. Secondly, um, I've sort of, I've, at last asked this, this lady said that she's met many of the neighbors. She's never met me, she's never met Wolves. I don't know what neighbors she's met. She talked about how she's gonna live there. Well, I do recall that when they took over Pomeroy, they built the condo in the back, and she and her husband lived there until they sold it <laughs> last summer. And my expectation is they'll do the same thing again here. The key difference is we're basically jamming more units into a street that's already overburdened, all right, with cars, with people from the downtown, and to the end, I'm questioning whether they have adequate frontage for this site plan, given that they're including property which has been essentially lost through adverse possession. Uh, I doubt that. You know, in, in again, I understand, and, uh, and you no, might be right, but that's not. Well, no, I don't want to. I don't want to circle no, no, around and discuss something that we've already talked. No, no, about. no, because if the plans that have been submitted to you are inaccurate, all right, if that's that's a legal issue, we could approve it, and if ultimately it, it, it turns out that you're accurate, then the project doesn't go ahead. But that's not for us to. We we don't make that decision. What happens next? Could you explain that? So if you issue a permit and then it turns out that there isn't adequate space, then what happens? Then it, it, it's null and void. It's based on the premise that the, the property line is as though it's shown, and it ultimately it's shown that that's not the case. And how does that determination play? I'm just, I'm sorry. I'm it, would become, it would become a legal issue. It hasn't yeah, been, Mark, yeah. maybe I can address yeah. that just very briefly. Yeah. I know something about adverse possession, um, and you may be right that the <clears throat> person you refer to has a claim that they can try to establish in court that you don't just get title to property by occupying it or purportedly occupying it for over 20 years. It's more complicated. You have to establish that right in a court and get a judicial decree. Actually, actually it's the other way around because if you lay the fence, for instance, if you build a fence, you lay a thing, it's theirs. If they try to build into that, you know, just, you know, this isn't a yeah. discussion I'm going to have I think, tonight. Was your question so. about how would it be discovered right. if, it, if right. it's not enough frontage? So that's through the building the right. uh, office. No, right. the person, the person who thinks they have a claim to No, I'm not talking about the claim. I'm just saying they go out, they find, they, they, they now understand whatever the property lines are, and, and your question is if it's not enough, mm -hmm. what happens to the project, mm -hmm. or how is that found mm -hmm. out? And that would be found out through the normal building permit process. Mm -hmm. Right, so one of the issues, just that this sort of takes us down the road to a different discussions, but um, one of my, um, one of the issues I raised in my staff report was the issue of um, making sure that the better knew the driveway was an encroachment and they could not, it wasn't part of the project and there was gonna be some changes. I think additionally the board could place a condition that says, you know, this, the drive, 
the driveway cannot be part of this property because it just it's not counted in the lot area as impervious surface. So that number would be different. So I would suggest you could write a condition that says prior to issuance of the building permit, the driveway um, um, issue with the neighbor has to be resolved and the pavement has to be pulled up from that property because it's not part of the site plan. The site plan doesn't show the <coughs> So to the extent that the applicant then takes steps to say, okay, I'm sawing off this part of the driveway, but before that they have to notify the abutter, that will be the point at which there will be a conversation about who's trespassing on what and who has what rights. Yeah. And it has to go through a court to make a claim of adverse possession. I think there's even case law specifically about driveways that driveways don't necessarily lead you to adverse possession. If I can respond to that also, there's a number of issues. Um, uh, first of all, uh, if, if, we, if this went to court and if, if that property owner sued us, um, and and one, the property would still have there would still be enough square footage to do four units. I would make the unit smaller, so I would have the same building. I would have setback, make the unit smaller. It's not going to change anything. There's going to still be four units, um, and they'll be totally compliant. Um, the second thing is um, that's not a driveway. That's a parking lot. It doesn't go to anything, and it also I couldn't find any permits that existed for that to exist, uh, for that paving to be there, for it to be that size. Um, I couldn't find any permit that allowed them to have that second huge, that's a, like a 20 foot curb cut. Um, they have a driveway on the other side of the house with, with an additional curb cut that goes back to a garage or something back there. Uh, so there, there's, there's a number of issues about that neighbor um, that are concerning and Carol and I did talk about this and having been in very uncomfortable positions with other projects, um, I wanted to make sure that my attorney was up to speed and that we had a project and that we knew what we needed to do so that I can then offer whatever I can offer to make it less painful for the neighboring owner. Um, I mean, there's tons of property there, so it's not like you know that they need that driveway to be on my property. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to say is, is, just to be clear for everybody, I hold title and deed to that property as surveyed with the property lines as shown. I own it, I paid for it, it's recorded, that is my property. Um, and the only way it would, any part of it would not be my property is if we were taken to court and after a lengthy court battle, I lost on the adverse possession issue. So, um, you know, as of right now, legally, from a city perspective, from every other perspective there is, I own that entire property within the property lines as surveyed. Okay, thank you. So, but we can just, as you said, make that a condition that needs to be worked out before we move forward. I move we close here. That's, I think Jane had one other thing. I, I just have one other thing to say. I, I promise I'll be brief. Um, I, I know the project that was done on Pomeroy um, that you just sold the unit for the condo for $500,000. Phillips Place is a street because of the fact that the way the uh, single family old grand homes were multi divided. Um, there are a lot of students, there, it's a lot of diversity, there's a lot of transients. Um, some of them have been SROs, um, and you know, it, it's been a really nice, affordable place for people to live. Um, and we really hope that doesn't change. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Yes. Yeah, I, I am Fable if I live at 28 Phillips Place. I've been there for about 22 years. I'm sorry, can you say your name again? Faye? Faye Wolf. Okay, thanks. And I live in a single family house, and I'm, I'm interested to see what the plans are. I feel, without obviously seeing this, building go up, that it is going to change the character of that property significantly and the street significantly. And I would just like to register my reservations about this project uh, and five garages and a driveway that I don't really understand how that driveway is going to accommodate all the cars and the group. And I just don't see how it's all going to come together. I mean, you're an architect, so maybe we'll be able to make it magically work. But uh, I'm also wondering about parking on the street that will be generated by these units, which really 
as Jane and Francis have pointed out, it's it's not easy to accommodate parking now. It's not easy to get in and out of my driveway every day. Um, there are trucks stuck periodically at that corner <laughs> because they can't negotiate the turn. Uh, um, so I would like just to reg register my uh, concerns about this changing in the neighborhood and creating some problems. In the okay. Thank you. Could, could I just make one last comment, by the way. A quick one, please. Exactly. I believe uh, this lady said that nobody would have bought the house but for her because of her. I actually know for a fact, because Drew Turcott spoke to me about it, this young couple offered to buy the house, but they were outbid by the developer. Thank you. Well, we close the hearing. Just a second. 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 <laughs> All in favor? Mm -hmm. Okay, so what that means the public uh, interaction portion of the evening is over. Um, and we will have an internal discussion, which everybody can listen to. Uh, but we can't debate anymore uh, between us and you. Um, so with that being said, who wants to start first? Yeah, I will. I, 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 I'd be in favor of uh, approving the project. Um, I, I think that the issue of adverse possession is not a real one, even if it turns out that the applicant were found by a court to not own all the property, property that they think they do, that's their problem, not the board's. Right, I mean, right. we're not certifying title to the property. Right. They, they'll somehow have to live with it. Um, I don't think that we can put in a provision, in a condition, that the driveway issue be resolved because we don't know that there is an issue and it would be impossible to, to define what resolution would, would, when it would be reached. Mm -hmm. I think we just leave that to the parties to deal with. If the neighbor thinks they own the property, they can file suit to stop the construction. Um, I sympathize with the condition of traffic on the street, but um, they have four parking places on site. So this is certainly not going to, I mean, I guess they can have visitors and, yeah, but, but there's four parking it, it, places. Eight space, eight eight sorry, yeah. two, yeah, yeah, two per unit provided. Um, so that's all that's required. And the issue of condominiums or price, I, I think is completely beyond our purview. It's, yeah, we have nothing to do with that. So I don't see the point of having of the staff recommendation about the fence and back because as was pointed out there's there, there's hardly any room there now if they plow snow onto someone else's property I guess that's up to the neighbor to tell them to stop I, I don't know that we have to worry about that I, I don't the, know that we have to worry about but we're in a position to do something about it well, well, we, and that's yeah, the, the, the street, the, the car well, we don't noise. know if the neighbor would like a fence or not. I mean, maybe, maybe they don't. No, but we, it, this wouldn't be unusual uh, for us to have a condition for a, you know, either existing vegetation that provides what we're trying to make the fence, the yeah. fence provide, which is a shield for the neighbors for incoming, you know, the cars. Yeah. Well, the headlight issue, though, is that a real one? Because I gather that it's all vegetation. It on the adjacent property. Well, I, the reason why I made that recommendation is because it's clear that a lot of that's going to be cleared out for the parking. Um, uh, but on, for the, the, on the neighbor's property, it's identified on the plan and shows on the on the Google map or whatever it is that vegetation, no structures on this portion of the neighboring property, right. extensive weeds, plant debris, trees, refuse. Right. If that's accurate. And I guess the other thing is on the rear, the structure is, um, there's a lot that's not consistent with the other lot that they, I think it's about the lower place. Um, mm -hmm. And um, so that structure, that house is set pretty far back to its rear lot line. So that was, that was the nature of my recommendation is that I don't know what would happen in the long term to that vegetation based on the excavation for the parking. And um, the parking comes right up to the property line, 
So that would just be, you know, sort of a barrier, there, a visual barrier for headlights. So, you know, that was my rationale for it. Mm -hmm. if you all, obviously, you guys can make the decisions. <laughs> Well, from the from the slide that, that that you presented, I mean, it looked to me not being an arborist or a landscaper, but it looked like a lot of invasive overgrowth. So okay. I think cleaning it up with a fence is not a bad thing. Um, plus, during the winter when there are is no greenery, and right. you've just got bare trees. Yeah. And there's if you look behind Unit Four, if you're looking at that that plan view, A one point one. That if you look if north is, is the top of the page, if you look south of the word unit four, you, you see an existing fence and three mm -hmm. plants that says E fence, E plant. So there is a fence along that line, and what we're proposing is continuing that fence, you know, just along you know the length of that line. So you're so when they come in the driveway, the lights hit the fence and not anything behind it. I agree with Carl, what, what is there that's a lot of overgrowth, and I think a lot of it is just going to come out when we do the paper. Yeah. I like this one. Mm -hmm. I think, it, I mean, I sympathize with a lot of the concerns the residents raised about parking and traffic and such, but this, I mean, this provides exactly, you know, we couldn't have asked for a better, I feel like, you know, more parking mm -hmm. that's situated in the back. It's exactly, as somebody who owns property in the central business district, this is exactly the kind of unit I would want to buy just outside of the central business district. As a one car household in town, compact, it, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, you know, street fronting, no garage fronting. I mean, there's there's just a lot of merit to it. I think. Right. Um, I'll I'll echo the truck route story. I sit on transportation parking in those places. It does have problems. I've seen pictures of the trucks completely stalled at that corner. But I think we ought to fix that problem. And spend, when we continually try, I, I don't mean to spin your wheels over it, but that should not be a truck route. I mean, that, that's, right. that's not a good escape route for trucks. And we keep grappling with that, and we keep dealing with Coca-Cola. I, I just tell you, we haven't ignored it. That's one thing I, I honestly can say to you, that we haven't ignored it at all. Um, I understand the parking downtown. I think that's mostly generated, I think, by the downtown businesses, not by the people on Phillips Place. Um, right. They've made a good effort to handle the parking that they're generating. Um, I'm um, having reworked one that should have been torn down. Uh -huh. I, it, it, it's appealing to me as a really tough thing to do. I think just the look of having turned around the first house well should give you some satisfaction that, that there's a vested interest in doing the other in a way that matches the neighborhood. So I know you can't tell that exactly from drawings, but I'd say that's already been proven by the commitment on the first house. So um, I, I, I'm, you know, it's, it, one thing that it's doing is it's filling every single possible bit of the, uh, uh, open space requirement. I mean, the percentages are really tight. Right. Um, and, but if, if it does that and it matches the rules that we set, um, I'm kind of encouraged that it is a model with uh, master bedrooms on the first floor. That's That to me is appealing to an aging population, which we are. Um, and it is within walking distance. And, and I do think that that area of town, the train station, and many other things going on, I think it's a pretty exciting place. Um, so, in, in general, I am you know, I'm thinking it's the kind of, yeah. kind of project we would. We're going to have to have some. And I think that's one that's that's made a great effort to try to fit in. It's like Jim said, you know, we, we've made the rules, let's see how we're doing with them now. And, and I think this one does. Mm -hmm. I agree. I think, you know, it, to Jim's comments, he was saying this, you know, I don't want to stop this if they're doing what the zoning allows, but this should give us a heads up to what, what could happen in other properties, but what could have, could have happened on this property is that first building needs to be knocked down entirely. Yeah. And, that, well, didn't, no. and that, yeah. that, that didn't happen. Um, and so I think this is 
a good faith effort, you know, to abide by the zoning that we just enacted and, and, and to do what we can within the parameters that they've got. Yeah, that's what we need. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And I so, looking at the staff report, um, could, uh, should we just focus on any conditions that we'd want to put on it? We had. Yeah. You want to go through them, Carolyn? Yeah. So we talked about um, the staking the corner. So I su uh, suggested that prior editions of building permit that um, the applicant notify Office of Planning and Sustainability to arrange a site meeting with staff and surveyor to on the site to stake the property pins and the building corners to confirm the setbacks for both the front and side setbacks. Um, and um, that prior to issuance of building permit, um, that the um, applicant with the um, consultation of the arborist install tree protection fencing around the trees in the rear, um, as recommended by the arborist in the arborist report, um, and the trenching that's also recommended. Um, but it also tree protection on the front of the property, those street trees um, should be, um, should have fencing installed because there's gonna be obviously construction close up to that. So um, the other piece, so there was a discussion about the sidewalks mm -hmm. and sort of looking at where those trees are. It's right where it's, it's right where the sidewalk would go. So I'm not sure, I mean, typically we require sidewalk, um, you know, extension. I'm not sure that um, since there is a sidewalk on the other side, it's a narrow street, and um, that it makes sense to cut down, no. <laughs> to have the city street trees come down just for a sidewalk. So that, that ends after right. the right. 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 No, I agree. Um, so um, then, um, then there's the traffic mitigation requirement um, but, uh, that. Um, needs to be met and sort of to address that because there are lots of needs about traffic mitigation um, that we know of that are expensive in the vicinity that would receive an impact. We have the offset since there wasn't anything offered in terms of actual mitigation. We do allow a payment in lieu of $1,000 per unit for a total of $2,000 one time payment to the city of Northampton um, upon certificate of occupancy. So for building? Per unit, one thousand per unit. So for a total of two thousand, but one time. Um, um, yeah, there's four units. Yeah. But the two units were there by right. So the only so there are only two new units. So the way the zoning is written is that if anything that triggers site plan is then what triggers the site plan requirement for the traffic mitigation. Um, so and then. Um, I would still recommend a site impervious fence along the rear to wrap around um, three feet in height um, and uh, to continue around the corner to the edge, um, the rear edge of the mm -hmm. property. And that snow should be cleared at all times to ensure that the parking spaces at the rear are accessible year round. Um, and then Prior to issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall show a resolution to the encroaching driveway. Impervious area for the driveway from the neighbor's property shall be eliminated from the subject parcel. To Alan's point, do we need to do we need to make that a condition that they need to make happy with the neighbor? If it, it's got percentage. To, the only reason is because it's got the right percentage mm -hmm. covered. I mean, yeah. if it, so, the other way to state it is that all the impervious surface that's on that property from the driveway has to be taken off because it right. then it relates to the open space. So either way, I mean, you right. could say make nice with your neighbor or just make sure that pavement's gone. Yeah, I don't think we can, I like we obviously like can't tell them to get along with their neighbors. <laughs> <laughs> or have the neighbors come along with that. We learned that lesson with car More to the point. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, right. <laughs> Okay, uh, so the impervious, so just keep it as, and then that can be done by the end of the project that they have to show that that's gone from, from the site. So before, before they get a yeah, occupancy permit. Right. Yeah. If it, if it, if so that is factored in, oh, just a closed. question about what she said. Yeah, I can't oh. So prior to issuance of certificate of occupancy, the impervious area from the driveway on the neighbor's prop on the neighbor 
the neighbor's driveway on the subject parcel shall be eliminated. Not the neighbor's property. Right. Right, right. The neighbor's driveway. Can we expand the fence option to include, um, you know, landscaping? I mean, it seems like that's a reasonable. If it works. I don't think if, it's but say, say that again. So there's this impervious, you know, site impervious fence. If it can be done with a hedge, you know, that's not. I don't know if it can or can't be done, but if it can be done, why not do it? Um, I don't think that we should make the assumption that it can't be done. Um, it's just, I think giving the option there, that either or would be a better way to go. So either a three foot hedge. Evergreen, or, or, or right, it, it would have to be a, a, right. So an arbor body basically, or something like that. Right. I just don't know that that's going to work long term. Like I don't know, it's a gravel drive, so I'm not quite sure how how a gravel drive gets plowed even. But uh, if it's salted at all, I, I mean, see it's what it's just going to get beat up. Um, yeah. I don't see where it would get beat up. Yeah. I prefer that. But Three foot yeah. high fences don't last very long either. But that's right. all about you know how we're going to look at it. Yeah. And they look like hell in a short period of time. But either way. And we can to make a larger fence to more of a standard size fence. The brick wall. <laughs> Boulders. Right. I mean, it could be any height. I think the minimum will be three. And, uh, but I certainly wouldn't suggest a six foot or an eight foot right. fence because then you're just creating a barrier. Right. Um, but the I mean, three foot that, is about what's there now. Oh, more well, on the rear of the property, uh, no, that's the front. Um, so this is just, I, I, there, I think there are sections, I don't know if it runs the whole, and I don't know what property line it on, it's on, but I guess, uh, you know, it's up to you all. I was thinking a consistent um, block for headlights, so whatever height that needs to be. I, I mean, maybe it should be, yeah, I mean, at least three feet, I guess, and but it be, yeah, but again, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'd like to see a shrub versus a fence as well. But if, if there was more than a foot, you know, right. like between the end of the paving and the, and the property line, um, but there's just no, I don't see any room yeah. to put anything that's not going to get beat up. <clears throat> Motion. How how do we stand on that in the fence? Uh, is it a minimum of three feet? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, who will we approve with the conditions recommended? One more question. Yeah. Um, the lighting plan, the waiver for the lighting plan. Um, just given our earlier presentation, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I it makes sense. I mean, to not have to do an, a whole photometric plan for this site. But is there any other? Is there anything, or can we at least kind of strongly reinforce Northampton's lighting requirements and the light pollution, and kind of make sure that any, if there's going to be any lighting, in well, the area or something. The, um, I think the request was based on the fact that they were only going to have porch lights and it would be under the okay. roof overhang. Mm -hmm. And they're still, the standards are still apply. So they're not asking okay. a waiver from the standard. Right, so we're just doing the plan. So then what happens is when they come in for the building application, we so look still at be reviewed the fixture mm -hmm. itself. Yeah. yeah, right. Okay. So we have a motion. Second. Sorry. Second. Second. That's okay. Wait, who was the second? Me. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Any discussion? All in favor?
because there have been some modifications and one counselor in particular was concerned that you guys did so much work on this thing and now they're tinkering with it and is it okay? <laughs> no. No. <laughs> So, um, as long as it doesn't come back, it's okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So now, I gotta find my stuff. So there's been a lot, of, the most of the discussion for the changes has been sort of reorganizing, which I think has been better, so I'm not going to go over that. Um, um, but then there are there's been some tweaking to the language for energy and we just came from energy commission this afternoon and got them they, they modified some of the language to say instead of um, requiring 25% um, lower or lower than the current stretch code call it the municipal energy standard because we might not have a stretch code in the future mm -hmm. so I think that's pretty basic but um, they've also landed on um, um, looking at 25% lower than the current energy code, um, but a minimum of 41 for the um, hers for the building envelope. So that then we t I think previously talked about, you know, you could easily get to 41 and you just throw some PDs on. So it's a little bit more stringent, but at the same time the codes are um, changing oh, like pretty rapidly. So there's that. Um, and then there was a language added to the open space requirement, actually bumping it up to 150 square feet or 15 square feet per dwelling unit. And all such spaces um, shall be contiguous unless weighed by the planning board. So you can't put 15 square right. feet here. Uh, this right. is just open space, we're not talking about parks. This is the part <laughs> piece of that. <laughs> right, the on-site um, park piece. There's your space. <laughs> yeah, right. right. No, that actually would probably work very well. Like, we would love that. You know, would have right, right. Right. Unit yeah. one, yeah. park, yeah. unit two, park. Yeah. Yeah. That would be for you. No room for a sculpture. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so um, then there's additional language added to streets and roadways, pre existing paths, historically used as bicycle and pedestrian trails, should be preserved to the extent possible and marked with appropriate signage. This is uh, all really has to do with the Lyman estate, that there are some carriage paths right, in there. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and vehicular access shall connect to surrounding streets as appropriate to ensure safe and efficient flow of traffic within the surrounding neighborhood and to mitigate increases in traffic on nearby streets. I think the increases in traffic on nearby streets was sort of the added phrase, because this was this is sort of a reworking of the language mm -hmm. you already saw. Um, Just before you leave that one. So with the reworking to make sure that you're looking at it in, as part of a network of streets yes. that connect as opposed to creating right. like a and highway that leaves everybody else alone exactly. or, okay. or yeah. like a private driveway or something. Right. Okay. Um, there was a section about digital equity added. Um, there's a section about digital equity added so that um, you know, if you're providing, so universal broadband access to all its residents, if that's what you're providing for the project and you're not um, providing it based on income or if you're affordable, creating an affordable unit, the affordable units uh, don't That's that. the New York City issue, exactly. absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so that's, um, and then um, equal, this is another issue that this, the council hasn't voted on this, but they wanted to make sure that all the, people who had their fingers on it heard. Um, also equal access, all projects shall provide equal access to building amenities, parks mm -hmm. and civic space, Same thing. Yeah. to buildings mm -hmm. for both yeah. the affordable and non affordable units. Different. Um, no corridors. Yeah. But it's yeah. the yeah. same yeah. principle. Yeah. It's the same principle. Um, and then there's been a, 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 a recommendation to bump up the affordable unit um, requirement if someone chose to opt for that to be 11% um, instead of 10%. And that's 11% is where we are now as a city, so we have about 11.3% units are um, under our state housing inventory. Mm -hmm. So it's really just a tweak up a little bit to match what we are. What so is 10 percent goal? What's that? In 11% of the goal? For the city. No, the state mandate is 10%. And we're at, yeah. and we're at 11 and change. Um, and 
that may be it. <laughs> um, there's still a possibility that the ordinance committee or that one or two counselors may suggest another moratorium, but on really big projects, like 30 or more. I don't know if that's going to gain any traction, but that was How many pieces of property that they're looking at with that actually? That's well, if it's 20, then it might be two. Yeah, that's what I thought. If it's 30 or 40, it's probably one. Yeah. Have you ever got any indication that Opal is not going to go with hospital town? Clark's. 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 What? That Opal is pulling out? No, just, I mean, that's, like, when you say one of the piece of property, yeah. that's right. the one. And it came before us a long time ago, and very little has happened. There's still, I no. To the answer, no. 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 <laughs> um, so that's about it. So I guess if you have anything, any feedback you want me to take back to city council about that, and you hate it, you're okay with it, that's what well, it was kind of minor, yeah. yeah, but yeah. Yeah. they changed and what they added is fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Okay. It's might be just because I'm really tired. It's not a dream. It's not a dream. It's not a dream. I'm going to have you approved it. That was the other item. Almost. Almost. I can do it. Did you make the motion? We had a triangle. Second. Yeah. Aye. All right. So, uh. So one more motion. Oh, uh, so no more. So not another meeting until November thirteenth. Yeah, what's up with that? Oh, we have minutes that we needed to. Oh, you already did. Raise your hands. I thought that was a jerk. Yeah. <laughs> now we need that. We need to do that. Motion adjourned. Second. Second. By Ann, all in favor? Yo. So those.